Okay, hi everybody. Uh, so today um, we are going to continue on with uh, semiconductor junctions, module five. And the goal for today is we would like to cover the behavior of the semiconductor junction, the diode, in forward and reverse bias. And so we're going to start off by looking at the uh, the behavior in the uh, in the energy band model. We're going to look at the physical model. And then eventually we're gonna uh, derive an equation that describes the IV characteristics in forward and reverse bias. So um, I think out of the diode module, this is um, mathematically the most involved. And it's also, I believe, conceptually the most involved. So it really builds on the, I would say the, the more fundamental and hopefully simpler concepts that we uh, talked about in the previous um, uh, two lectures, okay? So the, again, the, the basic question we wanna to answer today is we wanna look at what happens on a diode if you place a voltage across it, a forward voltage or a reverse voltage. So last time in class, we talked about what happens to a diode at equilibrium when there's no voltage applied. So that's the key difference. All right, so um, let's see. Um, I know it's going to seem a little redundant, but um, because we're talking about the behavior at forward and reverse bias, I just want to rehash what happens at equilibrium so that you remember uh, the key differences. So in equilibrium, uh, you have like your, um, your p-type material and then your n-type material. And the key thing that happens at equilibrium is that the electrons from the n-type material diffuse over to the p-side and recombine. The holes diffuse from the p-side to the n-side, and then they recombine and you're left with uh, a depletion region in the middle, which consists of positive charge on the n-type material, the positive dopant ions here, negative dopant ions here. And because you have a buildup of positive charge and negative charge, you end up getting an electric field. And this electric field creates drift current and that will cause electrons to drift back this way and the holes to drift back the other way. Okay, so at equilibrium, the key point is that drift and diffusion are balanced, okay? Again, I'll say that uh, drift and diffusion are balanced at equilibrium so that the net current is zero. We're gonna see that equilibrium is, up, um, is changed. The balance of drift and diffusion is changed once we go to forward or reverse bias. So this is physically what was happening. And then we talked about the energy band model of the PN junction at equilibrium. So uh, just the key points here, if you could imagine what the uh, two sides of the junction might look like before um, they're in contact with each other, we've drawn P-type materials, we've drawn N-type materials. And the key thing is that the Fermi levels at equilibrium, they line up and they form just a flat horizontal line. So we're gonna see that this is no longer the case when in the forward or reverse bias, that the, the Fermi levels actually have a separation. But at equilibrium, the Fermi level is a flat horizontal line, it means no voltage is applied. There's no voltage potential difference between one side or the other. Um, and as we found is that when you line up these Fermi levels at equilibrium, the other bands bend around here like this. And uh, the key point here is when you're analyzing, okay, I'm gonna skip, on, skip the drawing portion of it. The key part of the analysis is that you have these electrons and then you have holes here, okay? And the, um, the, there's an energy barrier that forms here, okay? And the energy barrier, it prevents all these electrons on the n-type material from diffusing into the p-type material, okay? So only a small percentage of them end up diffusing and it's that small percentage that happen to have enough energy to be above this potential barrier, okay? So there's, um, there's a little bit of diffusion and then there's um, also a little bit of drift if you imagine that there's a few electrons in the p-type material. Remember, p-type materials also have electrons, just very few of them. Those few electrons will go down the slope here and they'll drift back this way. But you can see here um, at equilibrium, just a reminder that the drift and diffusion currents end up being uh, balanced because there's just a little bit of drift current up here a little bit, I'm sorry, a little bit of diffusion current up at the top here, a little bit of drift current down here. Okay, good. So um, I'm gonna skip over all the details that we talked about in the depletion region last time. 
And now we can go um, on to uh, today's discussion. Okay, so um, it, it, today we're gonna talk about uh, what happens in steady state. So this portion of uh, the, uh, um, this Venn diagram here, okay? So the reason why this is set up as a Venn diagram, I don't know how much I mentioned this last time I showed this uh, little graph here, but uh, basically Venn diagrams show what's the most general case and what's the most uh, specific uh, case. Um, so the most specific case is equilibrium. Equilibrium is where you have no stimuli at all. Uh, this is the case where the external excitation is equal to zero. As we talked about, JN drift plus JN diffusion is equal to zero. The whole uh, drift and diffusion components, they add up to zero. The, the electron drift and diffusion co components add up to zero. As we found that this, the Fermi level has zero slope and no discontinuities. It is a flat horizontal line. And then one of the other relationships that we looked at at equilibrium is that NP is equal to NI squared. Okay, now if we go one step beyond this, a little bit more general than the no stimuli situation is where we have constant stimuli. The most general case is where we have time varying stimuli. So I want you to just see in reverse is that a steady state is just a special case of um, time varying stimuli where the variation happens to be zero. And equilibrium is just a special case of steady state where you have a constant stimuli, but that constant stimuli happens to be zero. And the types of stimuli that you can apply would be things like electric fields, light, and heat. So we're gonna be talking about what happens when you apply an electric field to a diode, meaning a voltage source. And we are gonna be talking about the steady state case. Okay, this is the case where the stimuli is constant, so we are applying a DC source to the diode. And um, just the general rules, if you look at the continuity equations that we talked about in the last chapter, at steady state, there's no buildup of charge anywhere, and your time derivatives of the continuity equation go to zero. So dp dt is zero, dn dt is zero. That means there's no buildup of electrons or holes anywhere, the, the concentrations don't change with time, and the charge, there's no buildup of charge anywhere with, uh, with, respect to, um, with respect to time. All right, um, now, uh, so when we look at this graph again, I just remind everyone that um, the transient case, the carrier concentrations can change with time. In steady state and equilibrium, the concentrations do not change uh, with time. So we're gonna be plotting out the carrier concentrations today, and just note that they don't change with time. Now, the difference between equilibrium and steady state is that the currents can be non-zero. At equilibrium, the drift and diffusion currents summed up to zero, so they were equal and opposite. But in steady state, what we're gonna find is that they are not the same. They are not the same. In fact, um, spoiler alert, the, the diffusion current ends up being larger than the drift current and forward bias. And in reverse bias, the drift current ends up being larger than the diffusion current, okay? So basically by applying a voltage potential to it, we are upsetting this balance between drift and diffusion. They're no longer equal to each other, okay? So how does that happen? Uh, well, we'll talk about that in the next slide. <laughs> um, the high level, Okay, we think about what happens when we apply a voltage to a diode. And the reason we're showing this slide first is, um, first of all, we're gonna be deriving this equation here, this diode equation. And I'm bringing this slide up first because um, I want to just make the connection between this class and your previous classes. In your previous classes, now, if you've taken a class in, uh, with circuits or diodes before, you've probably learned this equation. This is the, the, the well-known diode equation. And in this class, we're gonna see where that diode equation comes from. But if you have not taken a, a circuits class before, let's just talk about the main features of this. Okay, so when we talk about a diode, okay, uh, a PN junction, the circuit element symbol for this is a little triangle like this, and then the two wires coming out the two ends, okay? 
So the left side is the P side, the one with the triangle, and the side with the, um, uh, the line here is the N side. Now, the reason the diode symbol looks like this is that it kind of looks like an arrow, and that arrow indicates that current flows in one direction. It flows from P to N. We're going to find out later that current doesn't really flow uh, very much in the reverse direction. We'll, we'll look at why that's the case. Okay. Um, in the forward direction, you can imagine what the forward bias looks like. So you take um, a battery or a voltage source, and you have the positive end here. Okay, the positive end is connected to the P side of the junction, and the negative uh, terminal is connected to the N side of the junction. So current is going to flow into the P side through the depletion region to the N side and then back this way. Okay, we're going to see that uh, at forward bias, current can readily flow through the device, but in the reverse bias, it doesn't flow very easily through the device. The IV characteristic, so whenever we have a circuit element, you know, something as simple as a resistor, the electrical engineers are always interested in what is the current voltage characteristic. So for something like a simple resistor, if you, if you were to... Um, put a multimeter on it and you plot the voltage versus the current, of course, you know that you're gonna get this, a linear characteristic. Okay. And, um, you know, with, the, with ohms, you know, this is given by V equals IR. Okay, so the slope of this line is equal to uh, one over R based on this equation. All right. So in a diode, the difference here is that, that the diode is a nonlinear circuit element. Nonlinear means that it does not have a linear IV characteristic. Okay, in fact, it's, it's pretty funky. If you look at this, what happens in the forward bias is you have an exponential IV characteristic in the forward bias. It goes up exponentially, okay? And because of that, we often like to think that, you know, engineers always like to simplify things. So when you see this exponential IV characteristic, that means even a small voltage is gonna make the current go really, really, really high, okay? And so what, what ends up happening is that you kind of look at this as a short circuit. In forward bias, it kind of behaves, if you, you know, from a very simplistic model, it kind of behaves as a short circuit in the forward bias. But if you want to have a slightly more detailed model, you can say it's an exponential IV characteristic. And the exponential IV characteristic is given by the diode equation, which is right here. All right. In the reverse bias, the diode does something very interesting. It basically, it flatlines at a small negative current like this. So when you start applying negative voltage to, voltages to it, we'll talk about this later, but it just flat, flattens out. So um, this current here, I don't know why it's labeled I gen, this should be just I zero. I zero is a saturation current for the diode. And it's just this tiny negative current. IO is usually very, very small, okay? Uh, you know, it might be on the order of picoamps or femtoamps. So because that current is very small, oftentimes we just approximate and say, you know, the diode doesn't really conduct, conduct any current in the reverse direction. Okay. So you might ask yourself, okay, great. So it has this weird characteristic. So what? It turns out that this type of the two things, number one, that there's an exponential IV characteristic, and number two, that the diode conducts current in one direction and it doesn't cr conduct current in the other direction. Those two facts are used a lot by circuit designers for various types of uh, applications. Um, diodes, for example, are used in rectifiers, as I mentioned. The fact that they only conduct current in one direction helps them rectify AC voltages to a DC voltage. Um, they're used in electrostatic discharge circuits. Uh, they're used in mixers in cell phones because they have this exponential IV characteristic has some interesting properties in the frequency domain. So, um, and they're actually also used as temperature references in circuits. Um, 
because of this, there's actually a temperature term in there. So you can actually use a diode as a temperature sensor. So I, we won't get into all the details of that, but this characteristic is, is used a lot by circuit designers and it's very important. Okay. Um, oh, I also didn't mention the logic gates. Um, these types of exponential characteristics can be used in logic gates as well. All right. So let's look at the forward bias, the energy band uh, model. Okay, so we're gonna compare the energy band model in equilibrium versus the forward bias. Okay. So the first concept, I'm just gonna to jump to the next slide here because it, it, it illustrates it better. Uh, so we're gonna start off with equilibrium. So just let's, let's recall that in equilibrium, um, the, you, you have an energy band diagram that looks like this. Okay, we just went over it in class earlier today, so I'm not gonna rehash this about carrier diffusion, creating an electric field, and then the built-in potential resists the ability of carriers to diffuse. I'm just gonna put it on here. Okay, this was the energy band diagram. The Fermi level is a, is a horizontal line going all the way across. The other bands bend around it. So this is your EC up here and EV down here. And then the way that we looked at it, we have, we have this potential barrier, okay? This potential barrier is prevents, you know, it only allows the diffusion of the highest energy electrons, a little bit of diffusion of electrons going this way, and then drift of electrons going down this way. Okay, and the two are balanced at equilibrium. So the other important feature of equilibrium is that there's this potential barrier here. The distance from the conduction band on this side to the conduction band on this side, this height here is the built-in potential in electron volts. So the height here is equal to Q times the built-in potential. So the way that I like to think about it is if, if the height here is let's say, um, 0.7 electron, uh, 0.7 electron volts in the energy band diagram, then in the real world, the diode um, uh, uh, potential is going to be 0.7 uh, volts, okay? So that energy barrier for electrons, there's also an energy barrier for holes as well. So the key thing I wanna show you here that is applying a forward bias reduces the energy barrier and it enhances diffusion and it reduces drift, okay? Uh, so let's see what that looks like. So when you're going to draw the energy band diagram at forward bias, this is what it looks like. So you're gonna start off with this very important concept is that when you apply a voltage between one side versus the other, one side of the diode to the other. So let's just draw this out. We are applying a voltage from the P side to the N side. So this is the P side and this is the N side. So this is a positive potential and this is negative potential. So this side has a higher potential than the other side. So the rule in, um, in energy band diagrams is that whichever side has the higher potential has the lower Fermi level. So in this case, the left side, this has a higher potential. Higher potential. So this is going to have a lower uh, Fermi level, E sub F. Okay, so that's why we show EFP, we show two Fermi levels. There's an EFP on the left side, which means a Fermi level for the P side of the junction. And then we also have a Fermi level for the N side of the junction. We call that EFN. Okay, so you can, you can already see here. I'll just write it down here for redundancy's sake. So this has a lower potential. And it has a higher Fermi level. Okay, now one way to remember why, why this rule exists is that, you know, electrons like to go from high energy state to low energy state, right? 
So the fact that this side has a negative charge associated with it, remember electrons like to go from negative to positive. If you apply a voltage source across something, electrons go from negative to positive. They go opposite the direction of the electric field. The electric field is pointing from left to right and the electrons like to go opposite the electric field. So it kind of makes sense in the energy band diagram that an electron that happens to be here would prefer to go from one energy from this Fermi level down to this Fermi level. The electrons would like to move in this direction. So the electrons on the right side have a higher potential energy than the electrons on the left side. That's why there it creates a separation of Fermi levels from one side to the other. So the amount of separation is basically equal to the forward voltage that's applied. So for example, if you were to apply 0.5 volts to the diode, if you applied 0.5 volts in the energy band diagram, you're actually creating a separation between the Fermi levels of 0.5 electron volts. Okay, I want you to see that, that correlations, like whatever voltage you're applying in the real world, 0.5 volts applied in the real world means that you're changing the energy band diagram. The distance between the Fermi levels is 0.5 electron volts. Okay, so now that we've established that we can basically manipulate the Fermi levels by applying voltages to them, what happens to the rest of the diagram? Well, um, as we said in class uh, last lecture, is that when you're drawing the band diagrams, the distance between, you know, this is still a p-type material, this is still an n-type material. The distances between the Fermi level and the P side and the valence band doesn't change. The distance between the, you know, the distance between the valence and conduction bands on this side doesn't change. The distance between the valence and conduction bands on the end side also doesn't change. So if you just draw out the band diagram on the left side first, and then you draw the band diagram on the right side after that, and you connect them like we did before, like in last lecture, what you'll find is that you, you still have band bending like this, but this potential barrier, you see how the potential barrier here was large? Now the potential barrier has become smaller. Okay, so instead of the potential barrier being equal to Q times V0, the built-in potential of the diode, this barrier has gone from QV0 to now QV0 minus VF, minus VF. Okay, so we've reduced that barrier height. So what do you think is gonna happen if you reduce the barrier height? Hint, I'll draw it out for you. <laughs> I'm drawing out the distribution of electrons. more electrons will um, start to, to flow from one side of the junction to the other. That's right. That's right. Here you see that the electrons have an energy barrier, so the electrons cannot diffuse from the N side to the P side. O only the high energy electrons can. But by reducing the barrier height, now you have many more electrons that can diffuse over to the, um, uh, from the uh, N side to the P side. Okay, so what's gonna happen here is that you're gonna end up getting more diffusion due to this reduced barrier height, the reduced energy barrier. Okay, and it turns out that this is, this is significant. This is significant because it, um, if you recall, the, um, the distribution of electrons, if you look at the Fermi function, the electron concentrations end up being exponentially related to um, uh, the, the Fermi level. So when we're reducing this even a little bit, that means an exponentially increasing number of electrons are going to be able to diffuse over this way. So if we, if we reduce the barrier height even further, you'd get many more electrons that would be able to diffuse over. It's not a linear, it's not a re linear relationship. Like if you cut the barrier in half, twice as many electrons would be able to flow over. It's not like that. 
it's it's an actually an exponential uh, number of electrons that start to diffuse over. All right, so the same thing is true for the holes as well. They also experience a reduced uh, barrier. So there's more holes diffusing from the P side to the N side. All right, so any questions about the energy band diagram, diffusion and equilibrium and steady state? Um, I guess I have a question on the, uh, the Fermi level. Sure. Here, um, I know here, and maybe this is written maybe for kind of like demonstration, but um, kind of where we have the arrows, um, those two don't kind of, they don't overlap at all. They just kind of like, it's almost like a step, right? Uh, which one here? Are you, are you talking about uh, the, the two Fermi levels here? Yeah, EFP and EFN, um, uh -huh. kind of at the left side of EFN and then the right side of EFP. Where yeah, we have the QV of F. I see. Yeah. So we draw the Fermi level on the P side of the junction and then on the N side of the junction. So on the P type material and then the N type material. Mm -hmm. So, but in the middle here, they don't really, yeah, they don't really overlap. Okay. Okay. So, so yeah. they just kind of right at one point, they just kind of just, it's, it's just a discontinuity almost. It's, it's level. actually, it's actually a transition. I didn't draw that transition in here. So it, the, it transitions through the depletion region. Oh, I see. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Because um, uh, if you look at, you know, if you look at the, the details of uh, where the, the voltage drop actually occurs, the voltage drop in the diode occurs across the depletion region. Uh, I see. Okay. Okay. So that's where the Fermi that levels would actually transition from one to the other. Okay. Okay. That makes sense. All right. Thank you. Yeah. So actually, if I want to be kind of like, you know, um, better about this, I, I do something like this. I'd show the Fermi levels transitioning from one to the other. And I guess the slope of that transition is the same as the slope from, of the conduction band and the valence band from PDN. Um, that's a, that's a good question. Not, not, I guess where it starts and where it ends. Where it starts and where it ends. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's okay, right. Okay, that's right. Yeah, yeah because yeah. because this slope here represents the slope in in the conduction and valence band. That represents where the conduction, where the depletion region begins and ends. Okay. All right. Thank you. All right. Remember, this is this is the depletion region. So yeah, this the Fermi level of transition in between. Uh, within the depletion region. Okay. All right. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. So um, well, this is an old slide. We can skip over that. Okay. So um, just to test everyone's understanding here. Uh, so this is a forward bias to um, diffusion and drift. Okay. Uh, so this is more a discussion question. Um, up here, we can see the, the band diagrams of equilibrium and forward bias. We went over that already. Uh, below here is a chart of the four different current components. Okay. And what it's showing is, um, yeah, let me just draw it here. This is equilibrium. And this is forward bias. This is equilibrium, and this is forward bias. Nope, I had that wrong. Sorry. No, no, no. This whole thing is equilibrium. Apologies for that. This whole thing is forward bias. OK. Now, what I'd like you to do here is I would like you to consider each one of the four rows here, rows one, two, three, and four, and label them as electron drift, electron diffusion, hole drift, and hole diffusion. Okay. And what these boxes are showing is it's showing particle flow and currents. So let's just do one of these as an example here. So, um, 
uh, let's see, at equilibrium. So we're comparing the magnitudes and directions of carrier movement at equilibrium versus forward bias. So if we take this first one as an example, uh, this is showing that at equilibrium, this particle, you know, the particle could be electrons or holes and it could be drift or diffusion. Uh, this particle moves from left to right. So it moves from P to N and the current also moves from P to N. Okay. And um, in forward bias, the particle flow and current is also moving from P to N, but it is amplified or it is enhanced at forward bias compared to equilibrium because you can see that the arrows are larger. Okay, so you have some hints here. So the particle flow and the current seem to be in the same direction. That's hint number one. Hint number two is that the the magnitude of this current get becomes enhanced at forward bias. So which one is this one going to be? It could either be electron drift, electron diffusion, hole drift, or hole diffusion. Um, I think hole diffusion is number one. Hole diffusion. Okay, great. Yeah, excellent. How did you come up with that? Um, so if I were to kind of like draw the, the pyramid of um, holes at the bottom of this uh, EVP and on the P side, we know that some will diffuse to the lower to the lower um, concentration EVN. Um, and for holes, the uh, flux and the current is in the same direction. Exactly. So it's kind of exactly. like an elimination right. thing, I guess. Yep, yep, exactly. So uh, you, you mentioned several important points. First of all, the direction is going from left to right. The particles are flowing from left to right. So one possibility there is holes. We know that holes diffuse from uh, left to right in the PN junction. Okay, another hint that you have is that the, the particles, the particle flow, which is a flux, and the current are in the same direction. So holes, whichever way the holes are moving, the, the uh, associated current is in the same direction. So that we know, so just from that, just from the fact that these are two, the flow and the current are in the same direction, we know that it has to be holes. So now we've eliminated electron drift, electron diffusion. It's either hole drift or hole diffusion. Um, I mean, the last hint that I told you basically holes diffuse from left to right. So we already know it's hole diffusion, but nonetheless, let's, let's give another hint. Another hint is between, if you compare equilibrium and forward bias, we, we just learned from our slides previously is that we know that diffusion is enhanced at forward bias. Diffusion is enhanced at forward bias. So that's why you see larger magnitude arrows here. So number one, row number one is hole diffusion. Let's label that. All right, so go ahead and do the same thing for um, rows two, three, and four. And I'll give you a few minutes to do that.
All right. So let's uh, uh, let's go ahead. So uh, does anyone have a response for row number two? Um, so I guess hole number two is, um, hole drift. Hole drift. Okay. So, uh, what is your, uh, rationale behind that? Um, the, the at equilibrium, the drift and, um, the fusion be equal and opposite mm -hmm. to maintain uh, zero net current. And then drift, if you look at four bias, doesn't have, um, a large contribution to to the to the current, I guess, in um, yep. drift in forward bias R. Yep. Excellent. Yep. Great. Yeah. So the two the two things that were mentioned that that uh, uh, Melvin mentioned is that um, uh, starting from the last one, you can see that the magnitude of the arrows between equilibrium and forward bias, you can see that the magnitude has gone down just slightly. Okay, we know that diffusion current is enhanced at forward bias and uh, drift current is reduced slightly. So we know that it's drift and that we know that it's holes because we know that holes drift from um, N to P in, at equilibrium. And we also know that holes and uh, the, the movement of the, the direction of the particle flow and the direction of the current is the same direction in um, uh, with holes. So this next one is going to be whole drift. Okay. And then um, how about the third one? Let's have someone else. It's, is that electron diffusion? Okay, that's correct. And what is the rationale? What was your thinking here? Um, electrons um, flow opposite of the current and then it's uh, diffusion is enhanced in the forward bias. Excellent. Yep. Perfect. And then, um, well, by process of elimination, the last one is electron, electron drift. drift. Yeah. Thank you, Corey. So uh, you can see with the electron drift that the, the particle flow and current are in opposite directions, and there's no enhancement. There's a slight decrease between. Uh, equilibrium and forward bias. So good. Uh, so now we have we have an idea of what the differences are between uh, equilibrium and forward bias, what the currents are doing. So now we're going to go into some of the details of the carrier concentrations. So this is going to become quantitative. And then we're also going to derive the diode uh, equation in forward and reverse bias. So there's a lot of stuff here. So let's, um, I want to keep this slide, um, I want you to refer to this slide in your notes if you get confused on notation, because the book and even the following slides have a lot of you know, subscripts and it can get confusing. So I made this extra slide just so you have this. Uh, you know, there's gonna be variables that refer to coordinates. So your XP and XN, here, let me, So these are your coordinate systems, XP and XN. These are the two X coordinates on the N and P sides of the junction. Um, XP zero and XN zero are specific coordinates. There's a specific coordinate that indicate where the depletion region occurs, where it begins and where it ends. And then here, there's four sets of carrier concentrations that we're going to be talking about. There's NN zero, PN zero, so this refers to the electron concentration on the N side and the hole concentration on the N side. So this would also be called the majority electrons and the minority holes. Okay. Remember on an, in an N-type semiconductor, the electrons are the majority uh, carrier and holes are the minority carrier, All right? So that's where the NN0 and PN0 come from. Uh, the PP0 and the NP0 refer to the hole concentration and electron concentration on the P side of the junction. That's what the subscript P means. Uh, so there's majority holes and minority electrons on the P side of the junction. 
And the zeros here represent equilibrium. That means equilibrium. All right. Next one is the, uh, the excess carriers. So what, as you could see from our energy band diagram is that when we apply a forward bias to the diode, you are creating diffusion of holes from P to N and the diffusion from, of electrons from N to P. So this is referred as carrier injection. You are injecting carriers from the P to N and you're injecting, elect you're injecting holes from P to N and you're injecting electrons from N to P. So whenever you inject extra carriers like this, they are referred to as excess carriers. And we talked about excess carriers in the last module. And some of the notation for excess carriers is sigma N sub P, sigma P sub N. So these are the additional carriers uh, due to the carrier injection. And that carrier injection happens when a voltage is applied. And then the delta NP0, delta PN0 uh, refers to the change in electron and hole concentration at specific regions, at a specific point, at the edges of the depletion region, at XP0 and XN0. There's two edges of the depletion region and uh, these two variables refer to the excess carrier concentrations at exactly those positions. And then, um, you know, in one-sided junctions, just remember, um, there's a notation for that as well. In an N plus P junction, that means the N side has a much larger doping than the P side. And um, in a P plus N junction, the, the P side has a higher doping than the N side. Uh, one little detail of that that I want to mention because it's going to become relevant on the next slide is the following. So let's say we have an N plus P junction. Okay, that means in an N plus P junction, N, A, um, N sub D is much greater than N sub A. The N side has a higher doping than the P side. All right, and so that, that basically ties into this fact. That means that the electron concentration on the N side is greater than the whole concentration on the P side. Okay, so the majority carrier concentration on the N side is greater than the majority carrier concentration on the P side. But here's the other thing, which, which is maybe a little bit less obvious, but it's important to know is that N sub P is much greater than P sub N. So what does this mean? The minority electron concentration on the P side is much larger than the minority hole concentration on the N side. Okay, so if you, you, know, if, if you, if you don't believe me on this, then just remind yourselves what is, um, you know, the N sub, sorry, start off with, P sub N, okay, this is the whole concentration on the N side is going to be equal to NI squared over ND. And then N sub P is going to be equal to NI squared over NA. All right, so from this equation, you can see that um, if ND is much larger than NA, what right, you can see here, if ND is much larger than NA, because these are in the denominator here, that means NP is going to be larger than P sub N. So if I state this in English, you can say, whichever side has the higher majority carrier concentration has a lower minority carrier concentration. Okay. All right. So let's, um, let's take one example here. So we, I, I just gave you an example of the N plus B junction. So if you look at a P plus N junction, this is where the acceptor density on the P side is higher than the donor density on the N side. Okay. 
So um, the uh, uh, the end the P side has a higher majority carrier concentration, but the N side has a higher minority carrier concentration. So um, I've drawn out um, what a diode like this might look like. So you can see this is the P side of the junction on the left, N side of the junction on the right. And you can kind of see here that, that the spacing, you know, the, um, this represents the doping density, you know, the whole concentration on the P side, you have a very high concentration of holes here. Um, and then on the N side, you have electrons, but the electrons that are at a lower concentration. So the electrons are spread farther apart. Okay. As we talked about last time in class, um, whichever side has a higher doping has a thinner depletion region. So there's uh, the depletion region on the P side, which, which has negatively charged dopant ions. This region here is fairly thin. And then the, uh, the N region is wider. Okay, uh, because it has a lower density here, um, it's it's wider. Okay, um, any questions so far on this diagram? What I'm showing you thus far. Okay, good. So now what we're going to do is we are going to draw out the carrier concentrations at forward and reverse bias. Okay, so we're covering both here. Before we do forward and reverse bias, let's look at what happens at equilibrium. Now, specifically what we're doing here, and this may not make sense why we're doing it at the beginning, but just bear with me here, is we are going to plot the minority hole concentration on the N side and the minority electron concentration on the P side. The leap of faith that I'm asking you to make here is that the behavior of the minority carriers can help us derive the diode equation. Okay, that's why we're looking specifically at minority carriers. Okay, so we're looking at what's going on with holes on the N side and what's going on with electrons on the P side. So let's plot out the equilibrium values first, right? So I'm showing you here the equilibrium values, um, NP0 and PN0. NP0 is the electron concentration on the P side. PN0 is the hole concentration on the N side. Remember, this is a P plus N diode, all right? So, that means the majority carrier concentrations P sub P is much greater than N sub N. So the majority carrier concentration on the P side much greater than majority carrier concentration on the N side. And the minority carrier concentrations, so N sub P is going to be much less than P sub N. All right, that's where this is coming from. That's why NP0 and PN0, you can see that NP0 is less than PN0 here. Okay, these are plotted out in two separate curves, uh, two separate areas of the plot here. And this is a log scale. So um, let me just remind everyone what, what the parts of the graph here. These are two different graphs, okay. Um, on the right side is what's going on in the end side of the junction. So you see that you have the X sub N coordinate. So we are going to be looking at carrier concentrations as a function of position. Okay, just beyond the depletion region. Um, and the Y axis here is P sub N, so minority holes on the end side. Similar, similarly, on the P side of the junction, we have X sub P, which represents the distance um, the distance along the P side of the semiconductor. Where X is equal to zero is at this dot here. The dot represents the interface between the two materials. That is X equals zero. Okay. Right? 
So, um, and the final thing is that this is a log scale. The y-axis is a log scale. Okay, so at equilibrium, these are what the carrier distributions look like. There's a hole concentration up here and an electron concentration down here. So the next plot I'm gonna show you is what they look like at forward bias. Those are the red lines. You can see clearly the whole concentration is, is similar to how it is at equilibrium out here. But when we get close to the depletion region, you can see that it goes up like this. Similarly, the, the, whole, uh, the electron concentration matches the equilibrium values until you get very close to the depletion region and, and it just increases beyond the equilibrium values at, um, just at the edge of the depletion region, okay? These represent excess carriers, excess carriers. So forward bias creates excess carriers. That's what's being shown here. So rather than just telling you what's going on, I'm gonna ask you, why, where are these extra holes coming from? Where are these extra electrons coming from? Think about that for a second. Would they be coming from uh, diffusion or something like that across the PN junction? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Excellent, Clayton, thank you. So remember these holes, at forward bias, you're getting enhanced diffusion of holes from the P side to the N side. You are getting enhanced diffusion of electrons from the N side to the P side. You are enhancing diffusion because you reduce the energy barrier. So what's gonna happen after the holes diffuse over to the N side, what's gonna happen next to the hole? It'll recombine. <laughs> It'll recombine. And, and just as a, as a refresher, why is it gonna recombine? Why is it likely to um, recombine after it gets over to the end side? There's a lot of electrons. There's a lot of electrons, yeah, yeah. So when the whole sees an electron, it's more likely to recombine. So similarly, the, the electrons diffuse from N to P and then they end up recombining, okay? So that's why when you look down here on the graph, you see the whole concentration why it's just going up like here at the edge of the depletion region, it's because you have holes that are dumping over, that are diffusing over from the P side and they're coming over to the N side, all right? So that's why you're getting this increase here. It looks kind of like an exponential relationship, an exponential decay. And in fact, it is. It's the same type of exponential decay that we saw in uh, chapter uh, four when we talked about uh, that that type of problem where you have um, you're lighting up one side of the uh, of the semiconductor and the the excess carriers are diffusing over to the other side. I think it's worth it to just uh, pull that up uh, real quick here, just to remind everybody, because I want you to see how these concepts relate to one another. I'm going to pull up the excess carrier slide here. And let me see if I can jump, jump right to that one. Yeah, so this slide here. Okay, we said that we are going to shine light on one, one side of the material. And that creates excess electrons and holes. And we said, well, you know, the, these excess electrons and holes, they're going to both diffuse over to the dark side because um, there's fewer electrons and holes on this side. 
But the key thing that we found here was that there was this exponential relationship of carrier concentration. I'm not gonna go over the details of the math here, but the key point here was that the whole concentration, there was an exponential decay. And the reason there was an exponential decay, let's just forget about the electrons here for a second. So forget about the blue thing and the blue arrows. Just look at the, the white thing and the white arrow here. The holes are gonna diffuse over and they're gonna recombine. Some holes are gonna come over right, and right away they're gonna recombine. Other holes are gonna get further before they recombine. Remember, recombination is a statistical process. Some holes may get further than others. But on average, a hole will be able to travel a certain length before it recombines. Does anyone remember what that length is called? What, we have a special term for it. Diffusion length. It's called the diffusion length, exactly, exactly. And the diffusion length describes the rate of decay for this uh, exponential curve, okay? This, uh, this curve is actually given by e to the negative x over LP, where LP is the diffusion length. And the diffusion length is a square root of dp times tau p, if you remember from last time. So we have a similar situation here because this is also considered carrier injection, okay? Holes are diffusing from the left side to the right side, and then they're recombining, very similar to the process that we saw earlier. So of course, there's gonna be this exponential decay, and this exponential decay, uh, the rate of decay here is described exactly by the diffusion length for holes. Um, same thing happens with electrons on the other side. So there's a higher concentration right at the boundary, and then it decays down like this. Okay. So that's how it's similar to the, uh, the, the injection problem in the last module. But th there's one difference here, and that is this, this initial amount here, the height of this. How much excess did we get compared to equilibrium here? That is the PN0 and the NP0. Delta PN0 and delta NP0, I'm sorry. So it turns out that this, and this, these two are both voltage dependent. If you apply zero voltage, of course, it's gonna look like this. It's gonna look like the blue lines. If you apply a voltage, then this is gonna to start to increase like this. And so you will get a delta NP0 and delta PN0. So these are both voltage dependent. And as it turns out, because of that, um, the energy band diagram that, that I showed you earlier, that moving the energy band diagram up creates an exponential increase in the amount of diffusion currents that are happening, it turns out that this delta PN0 and delta NP0, um, just um, that, that these are both exponentially dependent on the applied voltage. Okay. If you apply a positive voltage, then the delta PN0 is in the positive direction. So you get this red line. If the voltage that you apply is negative, then the delta P in zero goes in the opposite direction and then you get these green lines. That is reverse bias, okay? So this can either curve up or it can curve down depending on the polarity of the voltage that you apply, whether it's positive or negative. Um, and then the, the key point of the diode is this, is that this delta P in zero here, okay? Delta P in zero, this thing here, the height of this line here is equal to um, the, uh, the whole concentration, the total whole concentration at, at, at the edge of the depletion region minus the equilibrium concentration. So it's the difference between the red and the blue lines. And this is equal to PN0 e to the QV over KT minus one. This is where the exponential dependence of the diode comes from. This is where the, you know, how the, the fact that the diode has an exponential IV characteristic this is the root cause of that. E to the QV over KT minus one. Uh, we have a short derivation of this on the next slide. Um, I'll just touch on that. Okay. So um, this line, this, this height here, it depends on the voltage applied. So it's exponentially related to the applied voltage. And it also depends on the equilibrium value. It depends on what PN0 is. 
the higher PN0 is, the, the larger the delta PN0 is going to be. All right, so that's the first um, uh, quantitative equation that you have here. The second quantitative equation that you have is the sigma p sub n as a function of x. So this equation here, the one at the bottom, describes this red line here, it describes this red line. So this is equal to delta, you know, if you think about it, this red line is just an exponential decay. An exponential decay has an amplitude out front, which, to, which is basically this height. And then it has e to the negative x over the diffusion length. So this is the height, delta p n zero, and then e to the negative x over lp. This is exactly the same as last module. Negative x over lp, this is the diffusion length. This diffusion length describes how, you know, how quickly this thing decays. All right, and then we plug in the values. So we have this equation for delta PN zero, which is up here. So we plug in a um, value for that. And that's how we get PN zero e to the QV over KT minus one, e to the negative X over LP. You'll have a homework problem here where you actually graph out uh, this equation and plot out what the carrier concentrations are gonna look like. Okay, but the origin of this, again, very simple. Holes diffusing from left to right, and then they recombine. That's what's re what results in this type of IV characteristic. Same thing on the end side of the junctions. We won't belabor that. Same, you know, same types of equations here. All right, so some discussion questions. Uh, first of all, um, how do we calculate PN0? Or actually, what is PN0? So if I'm remembering this right, you had like the, the big chart. This is holes on the inside. Oh, so yeah, on the inside at the, the at the edge of the depletion region. Is that um, right? Close, close. I mean, delta PN zero is something even simpler. It's just the hole concentration on the end side, equilibrium hole concentration on the end side. Let me add an equilibrium. Okay, okay. Just to be totally clear. So this is um, the PN zero then is just equal to NI squared over ND. Right, and just to be complete here, the NP zero and I squared over NA. Okay, next question. At forward bias, why does carrier concentration increase at the edge of the depletion region? We've answered that many times, but this is basically the diffusion of carriers from the opposite side. This is a good question. At what X position will we have the largest hole diffusion current? So this is a tricky question, gotta think about this. What I'm showing, so again, the question is at what position, where in the diode are we gonna have the largest hole diffusion current? Would it be X and O? Excellent. Yeah, that's right. Was that was that Corey? Yep. Corey, excellent. So um, explain your reasoning. Um, so I think was that question that question had forward bias, right? Or, or contained mm -hmm. forward bias? Yeah. Um, so at that point, your X and O um, is at the, I guess, highest point if you follow that red line. Mm -hmm. um, on the minority holes on the end side. So the uh, density there should be the highest, I would think. The hole concentration, you're correct. The hole concentration is at the highest at Xn zero. But there's a subtle point about this question. The, the question is actually asking something oh, well, just slightly different with diffusion current. 
He's asking about the diffusion current. You're correct that the, the largest hole concentration is at Xn zero. Mm -hmm. or it I, turns out it turns out the largest diffusion current is also at Xn zero. <laughs> so you're, you're, yeah. you're correct, you're correct. So I just want to make sure your reasoning is correct. Why is the current the largest at Xn zero? Slightly different reasoning here. So whole diffusion is going from P to X left to right. Mm -hmm. Yep, yep. Um, so why would the magnitude be the largest? Think about the equation that describes uh, diffusion current. So JP diffusion, just remind you here, JP diffusion is equal to uh, negative Q DP times DP DX. So this is the equation for whole diffusion current. Why is this one a maximum at Xn zero? Um, not sure. Okay, no, no, no problem, no problem. Let, let's reason this out together then. Uh, so uh, this, this is a constant, right? Q is a constant. And then this is also a constant. So this is the term that we really wanna think about. Yeah, the, the slope is the largest at that point. There you go, yeah, exactly, yeah. exactly. The slope, if you look at the slope here, the slope of this line, slope is largest um, at xn zero. So wherever the slope is the largest is where you're gonna have the most diffusion current because diffusion is driven by a concentration gradient. So excellent, we got, we got that. Thank you, Corey. Um, so at what X position will you have the largest whole diffusion current at Xn zero where maximum slope in concentration curve? Or in other words, maximum dp dx. All right, next question. What is the diffusion current in the neutral region? So the neutral region is this region out here. Can everyone see the, the, that little red cursor? Um, the little pen dot? Yep. Yeah. Okay, okay good. Yeah, so the region out here is the neutral region. You can use the laser pointer to make it better larger. This is the a neutral region here where basically these lines flat, flatten out here. So what would be the diffusion currents here? Again, the hint is it has to do with the slope. That would be zero. It would be zero, exactly. The slope is zero, so the diffusion currents are going to be zero. So dp dx is zero, so the um, slope is zero, so the diffusion current is also zero. And that's true for electrons as well. So we can divide this chart here into some, you know, I'm just gonna erase some of this clutter here. So this is the neutral region. And the neutral region is where basically um, there's no slopes, there's no extra excess uh, currents, there's no excess carrier concentrations. It, lo it looks like the equilibrium material basically. So this is the neutral region out here. This is also the neutral region out here. And 
the region in, in the middle here is called the depletion region. Um, and then these regions out here, some of, the, some of the books call them different areas, but this, is, this could be called the active region. Some people call it the diffusion region. Now in the okay. depletion region, our diffusion current is zero or is it undefined? Ah, good question. In the depletion region, because the, the Shockley ideal diode approximation actually tell, tells us that the, that the electron and hole concentrations in those regions are very, very small. They're negligibly small. The reason why it's called the depletion region to begin with is uh, it's because that region is depleted of holes and electrons. This, so it's not to say that hold, there's no holes or electrons in there. Holes and electrons are obviously transiting through that depletion region, but they don't spend much time there. So the average concentration there is, is actually very low. Okay. So okay. that's why we say that in the depletion region, there's very low electron and hole concentration so the con remember depletion. Remember that diffusion is driven by a concentration gradient. So if there's no concentration gradient in the depletion region, then there's no depletion uh, diffu diffusion current. Thank you. Yeah. There is a strong electric field in the in the depletion region. So. You could argue that well, there's a drift current there. Um, okay, now um, this problem here, calculating carrier concentrations, um, I'm gonna, you know, I'm gonna do something just that's kind of cheating a little bit um, because I know that you guys can go back and watch the recordings here later, and I want to just go through this example fairly quickly with the rec uh, recognition that. If you have any questions about it, you can just um, refer back to this. That way we can cover a little bit more material in the forward and reverse bias um, uh, on the next few slides. All right, so the example is the calculating carrier concentrations. This is a, a very identical to what you'll have in the homework problems. So the problem would typically look like this. Suppose you have an abrupt uh, silicon PN junction at uh, 300 Kelvin. Okay, uh, the area of the diode you'd be typically would be given, and you are, you're also given that you have an applied voltage. Your forward voltage applied is 0.5 volts. On the end side, you're given all this information. You're given the doping, you're given the carrier lifetime for holes, and then you're given the mobility of electrons and holes. You could look up the mobilities on the chart, of course, but you know sometimes they'll just be given to you just to make things a little bit easier for you. And then you're given similar um, uh, similar statistics or constants on the p side. So what you'll typically do in these types of problems is that you'll be first asked to figure out the equilibrium concentrations. So the first step is p n zero, n p zero, n n zero, p p zero. So the electron and hole concentrations at equilibrium on the N and P sides. So in other words, you're being asked to first figure out these blue lines, okay? Then you'll be asked to figure out the equations for the red lines, the carrier concentrations, and then you'll be asked to figure out the diffusion currents. So the next question here is calculate the excess hole concentration at the edge of the depletion region at Xn0. So we're being asked to figure out the, just the, the excess concentration at a specific point, Xn0. And then the ex, excess electron concentration at the edge of the depletion region at negative Xp0, so on the other side of the junction. And then finally, calculate the excess hole concentration 100 microns away from the depletion region on the end side. Um, at a specific value of X of n so that you have to actually uh, use that full equation 
for um, uh, the profile. So if you're just being asked to figure out the uh, excess uh, electron or hole concentration at xp0 or at xn0, so right at this line here, then you can just use these equations, delta pn0 and delta np0. And those are given to you. Those are the first equations up here. And if you're being asked to calculate some distance away, then you have to use the full equation down here, which has the additional e to times negative xn over lp if you're looking at the holes on the n side, or negative x of p over ln if you're looking at minority electrons on the, on the p side. OK, so um, the rest of it is just, um, is just math here. Um, do I, excuse me for a second. No, I thought we had a solution for that problem here. We do, that solution seems to have um, seems to have uh, disappeared. <laughs> so um, how about this then? I'll go back to my original thing and, and just um, just tell you that this, this problem is uh, virtually identical to the problem that you're going to have in your homeworks. And um, I basically just told you how to solve these problems uh, using those equations. So uh, there's a lot of numbers involved. I know it's a lot of, a lot of it may be just plug and chuck, but um, when you're doing these problems, refer back to that diagram, actually draw out that diagram in your head um, or on your piece of paper and actually label the points that you calculate here. Okay, so that way you'll have a good picture of the numbers, what, the numbers that you're actually calculating, what they actually mean. Okay, so um, there's a few slides here on just deriving what the carrier concentrations are. Um, this distance here, you know, like how much extra hole concentration did we have? How many, how much extra electron concentration that we have? Uh, this is a figure from the book. So it's, it's very similar to the slide I showed you two slides earlier. So we want to figure out what, how, how do we derive how much extra uh, holes there are? The excess hole concentration on this side, the excess electron concentration on this side. And um, you don't need to know this for the exam or test or your homeworks. Um, I just want you to know how to use the equations. So that being said, I just wanna to touch a little bit on, like if for those of you who are you know, gonna be uh, continuing to do more work in this area and you wanna know a little bit about how they're derived, I'll just quickly go over that. So you start off with the equilibrium relationships, okay? Um, the equilibrium equation for uh, uh, built-in potential, V0 is equal to KT over Q ln of N A N D over N I squared. This is the equation that you can quickly use to find the built-in potential. Um, you've done a calculation on this already. If you um, just sort of reformat this equation here, you make a substitution here, excuse me, N I squared, N I squared over um, N A, is actually equal to PN0. This is the Ni squared over Na is a minority electron concentration on the P side of the junction. And Nd is equal to um, uh, the whole concentration uh, on, the, on the P side of the junction. I'm sorry, <laughs> Na, let me rephrase that. Sorry for the confusion. Na is, is equal to PP0. Acceptor density is equal to the whole concentration on the P side. Ni squared over Nd is equal to this PN0, the whole con minority holes on the N side of the junction. Okay, so this is uh, fairly straightforward to uh, obtain. Now, if you take the ratio of the two, so if you take this and then you solve for, um, you know, you're solving for this ratio here, you have to take the uh, in exponential to get rid of this LN. So you just, uh, come up with this equation here, PP0 over PN0, this ratio here is equal to E times QV over, over KT. And you can already see here, this is where the exponential relationship comes from. You already have an exponential here. Now from here, um, 
when you're in forward bias, this is an equilibrium, it's an equilibrium equation. If you apply forward bias, this V0 becomes V0 minus VF. And if you think about this, this is all coming from the energy band diagram. Remember, like we reduce the barrier height from V0 and it's reduced down to V0 minus VF. So that's why we can substitute V0 minus VF wherever we see this. Um, so that's how we come up with this equation here. So this is saying the whole concentration at the edge of the depletion region on the P side and over the whole concentration at the edge of the depletion region on the N side is equal to this. Um, and so we're making some assumptions here. We're assuming low level injection and we're assuming that the, um, the fractional majority carrier concentration change is small, meaning we are injecting some, some carriers that is significantly less than the majority carrier concentration. That was also referred to by a term called minority carrier um, in, injection. Okay, I'm sorry, <laughs> low level injection was the term that we used. Okay, so then you have the P uh, at Xn zero over Pn zero. Okay, at P, P at Xn zero is equal to Pn zero here. This is equal to uh, e to the QVF uh, over KT. Okay, there's a little bit of math here that we um, that we skipped over here just in the interest of time. You can see that this equation is a function of V0. This equation here is a function of V0 minus VF. So if you take the ratio of these two equations, you can come up with this equation here. So it's just math. And then, um, then you here you have to sub subtract out the equilibrium concentration. Because remember, we want to find the, the difference here. The excess carrier concentration, this is giving us the, uh, the total concentration here. And we, we need to subtract out the equilibrium values. Okay, and this is where the, these equations uh, come from. Okay, but the key point is that this exponential relationship came from the fact that from the energy band diagram is that that energy barrier goes from V0 to V0 minus Vf. Okay, and um, wow, it's already 7.05. Um, looks like we're only going to have time to just get into the diode equation and a little bit of the reverse bias. Uh, so now that we know the distribution of minority carriers, now we can calculate the, uh, uh, the diffusion currents that are injected into each of the junctions. So the reason we're doing this is because now we wanna derive a relationship that gives the IV characteristic of the diode. Okay, remember the voltage current relationship. We wanna derive where this IV characteristic comes from. And it turns out we can do that now. We can do that basically because we know, we know the carrier concentration profiles. So the logic is this, like the first time you're looking at these types of things, we often get lost in the math, but I wanna make sure that you understand the logic, okay? The logic is this, is that at forward bias, your, your carrier concentration profile looks like the red line, okay? And we have specific equations for the red line, okay? So there's equation for the red line here, equation for the red lines here. So these are, the, these are telling you what the carrier concentration profiles look like. Once you know the carrier concentration profiles, you can derive the diffusion current. Because remember, it, the, the diffusion current is just Q times the diffusion coefficient times the gradient. So the derivative of the concentration profile. So if you have the concentration profile, you can calculate the diffusion currents. So that's what we're doing here. Okay, so we're calculating. <clears throat> so you could calculate the diffusion current of holes at this point. Okay, that is going to be where the maximum hole diffusion occurs. Then we're also going to calculate the maximum electron diffusion that occurs at this point of the junction. Okay, those two numbers, it turns out, are important because um, whatever diffusion current that you get here, just at the edge of the depletion region, 
is actually equal to the current that you have going through the uh, depletion region. <laughs> I'll say that again. Whatever current that you have here at the edge of the depletion region is equal to the current that you have going through the depletion region. Okay, that is because of something called the Shockley ideal diode approximation, which the Shockley ideal diode approximation states that there's no recombination happening in the depletion region and the concentrations of carriers are very small. Okay, so because of those two things, because you cannot have any recombination, you're not losing any carriers in the depletion region, that means whatever current is coming out on this side has to be the same throughout the junction. Okay, so another way to think about this, which, which may be helpful to you coming from a circuits background is to think about Kirchhoff's current law. If you calculate what the diffusion current is at this point, okay, that current has to come from somewhere. It's coming from holes that are dumping over from the other side. So whatever current, if there's no recombination happening in the depletion region, meaning if you're not losing any holes in the middle here, that means however many holes you have coming in to the depletion region on this side is equal to the number of holes that you have coming out of the depletion region on the other side. Okay, so basically by calculating the diffusion current just at one point, which we can do now because we have this, these two equations here, you have this equation and this equation, we can also calculate what the diffusion current is going to be through the depletion region. In fact, the total current, um, the, the, the current through the depletion region, I, I, I wanna clear, clear up something. Whatever the diffusion current is at this point is equal to the total whole current uh, through the depletion region. Okay, the part that I misspoke about was I said that in the depletion region, this is all diffusion current. Okay, and that's the, that's the thing that, that is not correct. You know, you have an electric field in this uh, um, a depletion region, so there can be drift currents. Uh, I should just say the total whole current going through the depletion region is equal to the, uh, the current that you have on this side. Okay, so on the left side, Again, the total electron diffusion current at this point is equal to the total electron current going through uh, the depletion region, okay? If you sum up the whole current in the depletion region plus the electron current in the depletion region, you will get the total current of the diode. And that is the strategy of how the diode current is derived. So let me just show you the equation real quick. So this is the, the total diode current at the edge of the depletion region. So this is for the holes. Okay, this is fixed law, Q times A times DP times DP DX. Okay. So the only difference between this and uh, the fixed law that you saw earlier, remember, Fixed law gives you the current density. So it gives you J. But if you want to calculate the total current, you have to multiply the current density by the area. So that's where this area's term is coming from. So the total whole current at the edge of the depletion region is equal to dp dx times qa dp. Uh, so dp dx is just the slope of the curve. Okay, if you take the slope of an exponential function, uh, you get the same exponential function, uh, but with uh, some extra terms at the front. So that's where the dp over lp comes from. Um, and then this delta p sub n refers to the same delta p sub n that we saw uh, several slides earlier. The de um, and the delta pn is equal to pn times e to the qv over kt minus one. Okay, this is pn zero just to the Make sure we're. Oops. So this gives you the whole 
current in the depletion region. Then the second equation, you, you can derive it in a similar way. This gives you the electron current um, within the depletion region. Okay, so if you have these two components, the I sub P and the I sub N, and you add them together, that gives you the total current of the dial. So you add the top component uh, to the bottom component, and you end up getting this diode equation, which is I equals I zero, E to the QV over KT minus one. You can see that, that these terms both had E to the QV over KT minus one. And then uh, these terms, the QADP over LP, PN zero, these terms become part of IO, okay? IO is equal to Q times A times DP over LP, P sub N, DN over LN, N sub P. Okay, you can see that the diode has two, the diode current has two contributions, the current due to holes and the current due to electrons. All right, so this is, um, this is a mouthful here. So, um, I think what we're going to do is next time in class, we're going to go over some of the details of um, you know, where this diode equation came from. And the next time in class, we are going to look in detail at all the currents at different points in the junction. So you know, what I mean by that is here, what we did is we looked at the carrier concentrations. We looked at the carrier concentration profiles at you know, at, at how the carrier profiles change as a function of X. Next time in class, what we're gonna do is we're gonna look at the, um, the diffusion currents as a function of X. And we're gonna see how the diffusion currents and the total currents change, um, you know, as you go through um, the, the neutral region to the diffusion zone, to the depletion region, again, to the diffusion zone, and again, to a neutral region. There's like five distinct regions of the diode where uh, interesting currents are happening. Okay, so next time in class, we will start with, um, we'll start with, uh, we derive the diode equation, we'll go into um, calculating diode currents, we'll do a quick example of that, then we'll get into, um, we'll get into like the distribution of diode currents in the different parts of the diode. And I think this is where we get really get into the nitty gritty of uh, you know what's happening inside the diode. So, okay, um, remember that you have your um, uh, your quizzes are going to be due before class on Wednesday, and then there will be a new quiz that's going to be assigned a new quiz and homeworks that will be due the following Wednesday in order to prepare for the exam the Monday before Thanksgiving. Um, finally, thank you for everyone. You, you turned in your, your outlines on time. I expect you to get feedback to you on that uh, by, the, uh, by the end of the week this week. Uh, any final questions before we end class today? Um, for the next exam, I assume that it's like another note sheet that we can make? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Same rules as last time. And the, um, the exam two is going to cover uh, diodes as well as uh, excess carriers, so modules four and five. So okay. we, should be, we should be through the diode chapter by, by next week. So um, work-wise, you can expect that, um, you know, between now and the exam, of course, since you're gonna have one quiz that's due this Wednesday, another quiz due the following Wednesday, you know, there'll be some, some work, but just remember that the, the quizzes, like before, the quizzes and the homeworks will prepare you for the exam. So just think about that as studying in advance for the exam. So, all right. Uh, thanks everyone. So um, see you Wednesday. If you have any questions about the quiz uh, need to meet before then, just let me know. Okay, thank you. All right, thanks. Thanks everyone. <clears throat>